Lord forgive me for this trap shit. Sergeant Smack make it backflip. Tell he hanged it with the action. With the vital speaking Spanish. Frank Matthews, how I vanish. Poof. Came back like I'm King Tut. Gold BBS is on a beamer. When fat cat was tearing queens up. Fall off the prop and I re up. Fly like Puerto Rican Jesus. Uptown like I'm baby man. Just caught a touchdown. And a major development in a case linked to Baltimore City Police corruption. A judge just sentenced a drug dealer in the case that launched the government's investigation into the gun trace task force. A gunman who killed a Baltimore police officer is entering its ninth day. 18-year police veteran Sean Souter was gunned down in a vacant lot. He was shot the day before he was expected to testify in a high-profile corruption case involving other Baltimore police officers. This is the case that started at all. Police were investigating a string of suburban overdoses. They set up a wiretap. They soon found out that Baltimore City police officers were part of the drug trade. A judge sentenced heroin dealer Antoine Washington for his role in a deadly drug ring. He sold the heroin that killed a teenager from Bel Air. The investigation into that overdose led the feds directly to the Gun Trace Task Force, a corrupt unit of Baltimore City cops. Disgraced detective Mamadou Gondo had been protecting the drug crew, enabling their business to flourish into a multi-million dollar operation. Well, I think Mr. Washington is appreciative uh, of the judge uh, imposing the sentence she did, considering the fact that there was a mandatory minimum of 20 years and he only received uh, two additional years beyond that. Washington himself addressed the judge. He said, I'm not perfect. I've done some things I regret and I'm sorry for what that young woman went through who overdosed. He said his prayers went out to her family. There were many good qualities I think the judge recognized in him. He has a great potential for the future when he gets out of uh, jail. At trial, prosecutors read Antoine Washington's text messages where he bragged about the overdoses as evidence of how good his heroin was. The case evolved and, and we really followed the facts in a number of directions that I never would have anticipated. All as the epidemic was ravaging suburban Harford County, which has had more than 100 overdoses just since the beginning of this year. At trial, people testified how they'd come to Baltimore City from the suburbs to buy drugs. And this case showed how the heroin epidemic has torn apart so many families. The judge told Washington that he was selling poison to other people's loved ones. Live at the federal courthouse, Mike Helgren, WJZ. Mike, thank you. All of the Gun Trace Task Force officers are awaiting sentencing. A federal jury deliberated about eight hours, then delivered its guilty verdict against the so-called Antonio Shropshire Drug Organization. Five men were convicted of distribution of heroin. One of them, Antoine Washington, known as Twan, was convicted of distribution of heroin resulting in death. Maximum penalty, a minimum mandatory 20 years. That concerns the 2011 overdose death of 19-year-old Jamie Lidlow in Bel Air. Steve Shenning is the U.S. attorney. It, it really is um, emblematic of the problem uh, with heroin addiction as we see it. A number of the addicts started out at, uh, getting addicted to opioids, one from opioids to heroin because it's cheaper and we're doing it uh, every day. The drug organization got help from former Baltimore police detectives Mamadou Gondo and Jamel Rayam. They testified as government witnesses about protecting the organization from police investigations and of stealing money and drugs. They were part of the elite gun task force indicted on corruption charges. Gondo and Rayam have each pleaded guilty. After the verdict, the U.S. attorney called for much broader solutions to the drug crisis than enforcement alone. You can't prosecute your way out. Yo, yo, we back. This shit is popular. There's a whole lot of mob business going on. We on our way to murder land with it. Body more to be exact. All my guys from the city, y'all get in the comment box, run it up. Y'all know the routine. Today, I'm going to do my best to try to tell you guys this crazy story. 
a story partly told to you by yours truly if you happen to catch the episode on the Baltimore Gun Trace Task Force that we did a while back. But when you fill in the blanks to that story, I would say a movie, but it reads like a show that should be on HBO titled We Run This City. Now, in this episode of Mob Ties, we are going to be documenting the times and crimes of a guy by the name of Antonio Brill Shrapshire. Now, Brill, just like the character I'm not sure if he's named after from the Will Smith movie, Enemy of the State, can not only attribute the takedown of his organization, but also the most dangerous gang that I ever covered, the Baltimore Gun Trace Task Force, as well as his rival, as he would go on to reach multi-million status in the heroin game. Now, there's not quite too many places that been hit harder than Hartford County and Baltimore by the opioid crisis. If I had to name some places, the first places that jump to mind would probably be like West Virginia and certain parts of Ohio. But Hartford County is going to be right up there. As in past years, just like a lot of other states, they've seen a rise in opioid overdoses with a lot of those overdoses being fatal. If you're from Baltimore City, if you hadn't seen, you probably heard the stories of the people coming over from the county into the city to purchase heroin. I also documented countless people that got caught up with drug indictments centering around heroin in the Baltimore area. One that comes right to mind is going to be Karan Dog Food Peoples, who, if I remember correctly, found himself on the opposite end of a state conviction after being tied to a number of heroin overdoses. But just as I was looking at Brill's case, I was almost ashamed that I thought that Karan Peoples was involved with a huge case. Brill, who had the full force of the federal government come down on him, who in an attempt to find love from behind bars on me, the inmate, would go on to say how he has a daily craving for muscles, Swiss cheese, and knowledge. He was on a whole nother level, and he was playing chess in the heroin game in the city of Baltimore. And it just so happens that Mama Dugandu, somebody who, when I released the episode, a lot of people got in the comments saying, I remember him from high school, that's G Money just happened to be one of Brill's pawns. But in how many years it's been since the drug epidemic changed from the crack game to the opioids or the heroin game, just like Jay-Z would say back when crack was what these pills are, I was a real star. It was some sort of shift that took place over the last 30 years. And it essentially took the drug problem from the black community and placed it almost in the white community. And that's not to say that the black community doesn't suffer with drug abuse and with heroin abuse. But what I'm saying is a young black person dying from heroin overdose is not going to bring down the full weight of the government on somebody. But in Brill's case, though he wasn't the one to supply her with the package himself, it would be the death of a 19-year-old by the name of Jamie Lynn Lidlow, who for some reason happened to be in Baltimore, not sure if she was away at school, as her obituary would say she was from Middletown, New Jersey. Born on August 20th, 1992, her obituary would state how she enjoyed gymnastics, skiing, water sports, the beach, music, as well as socializing with friends. But when she was fatally overdosed just after Christmas in 2011 on December the 28th, that would essentially mark the end for Brill's organization as well as the Baltimore Gun Trace Task Force. Now, I'm not quite sure when this case exactly went federal, but after Jamie Lidlow would be found in that Bel Air, Maryland basement, based on court transcripts and just like any other investigation, the authorities went directly to her phone where they would find that she had been in contact with a 41 year old named Kenneth Diggins, who was a very, very interesting character. Authorities would uncover a text exchange between Lidlow and Kenneth Diggins, where he would text, 
you need to come over so I can share some of this holiday joy. If you want to come join in on the Christmas party, it's on me. Don't forget, I got a Christmas present for you. Now Diggins, who was 35 at the time, would go on to admit to the court how he was divorced, unemployed, and was using credit cards with cash advances to buy heroin from Baltimore drug dealers. Going on further to admit to jurors that his drug use started with marijuana and progressed to mushrooms, ecstasy, cocaine, then prescription painkillers such as Oxycontin. Saying when he met Jamie Lidlow in October of 2011 through friends, he had already been snorting heroin for about three years. Continuing from that text exchange, they would see that Jamie Lidlow would text back, woohoo, be home tomorrow. Diggins then admitted to the authorities that the next night they put it in their nose and they would proceed to do their thing. Then saying the morning after he smashed, she would return to his house with her friend. The three would put together $720 where they would drive to buy six grams of heroin from a guy in Brill's organization by the name of Antoine Twan Washington, subsequently linking Brill to that investigation, subsequently tapping his phone hearing the conversations between him and Mama Dugando, or G Money, from the Gun Trace Task Force. The indictment would even get deeper after the death of Jamie Lidlow, as it would show that Brill was essentially using G Money at his command, as he would have some sort of issue with a drug rival in the neighborhood by the name of Aaron Black Anderson. On orders from Brill, G Money was to rob Black. G Money would go on to, in a sense, subcontract the job to another corrupt officer from the Gun Trace Task Force by the name of Jamel Rayum. Jamel Rayum would come up with a plot to put a GPS tracker onto the rival drug dealer's car. And when they would determine that he was far enough from his residence, they would go into his residence and rob him. But when they did so, his girlfriend would be in the house. And Jamel Ram would end up essentially threatening her life if she didn't let them know where the drugs as well as the money was. The officers would proceed to steal the drugs, which they would return to Brill to sell, while keeping the money from the robbery and splitting it up amongst each other. Brill would go on to write a book titled The Real Strapshire Organization, where he would go on to detail his life inside the drug trade as well as the relationship with the Baltimore Gun Trace Task Force. But with this having such a movie-like plot, it wouldn't stop there. As on April 25th, 2022, HBO would launch a six-episode series titled We Own the City. That is, sometimes they would say that this is loosely based on something. But that show is tightly based on Anthony Brill Shrapshire's federal case. Now, y'all make sure y'all hit the red subscribe button right under this video so y'all know when this real trill spill shit is dropping. Y'all get in the comment box below. Flooded all my guys from Baltimore. If you was around the city at this time, you know we need you down there. Y'all let me know what cities we need to go to next, what stories we missed, what gangsters we haven't covered, what we got wrong. And y'all get at me however y'all see fit, man. Y'all call me, text me, tag me, tweet me, mention me. Email me, CC me, stop me in the street. However y'all want to handle it, man. Shit got popular. Mob, gang, 